Jesus al Qadim alayhi salam. And therefore, given that tonight is a Thursday night, given that tonight is the night of the Shahada of Imam Musa al Qadim alayhi salam, given that tonight is the night of that Imam that is known as Babul Hawa, it's the door to the wishes of du'as. Therefore, the topic of discussion that I have titled tonight's discussion is titled The Dua of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. So brothers and sisters, we just got to the point where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives Musa alayhi salam a task, a challenging task, an impossible task, no doubt. And Musa alayhi salam's response to that was, I will happily accept this challenge. I have a few du'as of my own. And so in the series of tonight's discussion, I'd like to present with to you around five to six lessons that we were able to derive from this du'a. And inshallah, verse by verse, we will try and decipher, we'll try and understand what it means when Musa salam asks for these specific items. The first lesson, however, nonetheless, that we are able to take from the du'a of Musa salam that no matter what challenges may come in front of you, no matter how impossible of the task may be in front of you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bigger than any problem that you may face. He is bigger than any issues you may face. He is bigger than any problems that you may have in your life. Therefore, one of the first challenges that come to you is take the lesson from Musa alayhi salam that whenever a challenge comes to you, don't tell the problem, oh problem, you are huge. But turn towards it and say, my Allah is greater than you are. As the saying goes, smooth seas never make skilled sailors. And similarly, a difficult free life never makes a strong person. You see, when we look at the life of famous individuals, we look at the lives of, for example, our beloved Imams, our beloved Prophets, but even if we take people more contemporary, if we take the lives of successful individuals, they may be chairmen of companies, CEOs, CFOs, footballers, or any other people. One of the things that is quite distinctive from their life is that many of them had to go through challenges. You see, we pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, please grant me the confidence. Oh Allah, please increase in me in my self esteem. Oh Allah, please grant me this, grant me that. How do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds to our du'as? Does he create a warm, fuzzy feeling in our lives and suddenly this whole world appears to be so confident? Or does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal his archangel Jibra'il with an injection, a serum, that suddenly this whole world becomes a beautiful, comfort-free zone place? Or does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us opportunities where we are able to practice this confidence within our lives? Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us opportunities where we are able to grow and develop from oneself. Similarly, the successful individuals, they've only become successful after they've gone through all of these difficulties. Gold and diamonds, they don't become as polished and as clean as we see them. But rather after going through intense heat, after going through intense difficulty, are we able to appreciate the diamonds and the gold and the pearls and the rubies that we see in front of us. Similarly, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us difficulties, in no way should we tell Allah, Oh Allah, why did you choose me? Did you have no one else? But rather take it as an opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to grow you as an individual, develop you as an individual. This is lesson number one that we take from the dua of Musa alayhi salam. Lesson number two is Musa alayhi salam had everything that he could ever ask for. He had the miracles from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala too, right? The miracle of the staff that turned into a serpent and the miracle of the hand that once he takes it out of his armpit turns light. These are two miracles, two things that defy the law of science. Musa had everything that he needed to go in front of their own. But yet... Musa salam asks Allah a dua, which is a very beautiful lesson for you and I. We may think that we have it under control. We may think that we have all of the skills and the competencies to be successful at whatever we want to do, which is true. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with the skills and competencies, but he's also given us the dua, which is a weapon that we can use against our problems, against our issues, against our challenges. The Holy Prophet has said, Ad-du'a us-silahul. Moment. A dua is a shield. It's a weapon 
for the believer against his calamities. Dua is the connecting rope. It's a beautiful thing, this dua. Dua is the connecting rope between the creator and the creation. Dua is the pronunciation of absolute poverty from the beggar that we are to the eternal absolute. Dua is a pronunciation of us being powerless to the all-powerful. Dua is a beautiful thing that can liberate an individual. Dua is a beautiful thing that can free an individual. Dua is to be used in every aspect of our life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ghafir, chapter 40, verse 60 says what? Qala, ud'uni astajib lakum. And your Lord, wa qala rabbukum, and your Lord has proclaimed, ud'uni astajib lakum, call upon me. And I will respond to you. This is a guarantee from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ask whatever you need to ask me. I will respond to you. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ أُدْعُونِي أَسْتَجِبْ لَكُمْ إِنَّ الَّذِينَ يَسْتَكْبِرُونَ عَنْ عِبَادَتِي However, however Allah says, if you are too arrogant, if you are too proud to worship me, سَيَدْخُلُونَ جَهَنَّمَ دَاخِرِينَ You shall be entered into hellfire in a fully humiliating way. Dua is a powerful weapon for a believer. In Musa alayhi salam we see, he, despite him having miracles that defy the law of science, still turns to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and asks him. Now, we go to, that was lesson number two, asking dua. Lesson number three, we now try and decipher the verse, Qala, Rabbi, Shulahli Sadri, my Lord, expand for me my chest. Now, we got to the point where Musa is asking a dua. You see, if, you, if it was you or I, we would have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Oh Allah, you've given me an impossible task, but now I'm asking a dua from you. Which dua am I asking? Oh Allah, Maybe I would ask for so much money that I would buy myself through the streets of Egypt. Maybe I would have asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for an army so that my army would defeat the army of your own. Or maybe I would have even asked for a disguise so that the people don't recognize me, that I am Musa and that I have a kill warrant, a death warrant against me. But the prophets of Allah know exactly what to answer. Musa alayhi salam says, Qala, he said, Rabbish, Rahli, Sadri, my Lord, expand for me my chest. What does this mean in Chirahu Sadr? What does the expansion of the chest mean? Allama Taba Tabai. Allama Taba Tabai in his Tafsir al Mizan, famous Tafsir altogether. He says that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when Musa alayhi salam says, Oh Allah, expand for me my chest, he said, You see, this chest. Is like a vessel. It's like a utensil which stores things, which holds things for you. And one of the first things that this vessel stores inside it is your secrets. Right? So Musa alayhi salam is saying, Ya Allah, you have given me your ma'rifa, but Rabbi, Shrahli, Sadri, expand for me my chest so that I'm able to hold your secrets further into my chest. Right, because if I have a small vessel, I won't be able to gain your ma'rifah as much. But if I have a huge vessel, then more of your secrets, secrets of the universe, secrets of the galaxies, secrets of the people will be able to be stored within my chest. So he says, Rabbi, shrahli, sadli, my Lord, expand for me my chest. That's interpretation number one. Another interpretation is that where is where does shaitan whisper? Yeah, does shaitan whisper in your heart or your chest? Alladhi yuwaswisu fi sudurin nas. In, in Surah Nas, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say, doesn't say it is shaitan who whispers into the qulub of nas, in the hearts of believers. No, in the sudur of nas, in the chests of believers. You see this chest is the vessel that holds your heart within it. Right? Your chest holds this heart. It's a vessel that holds this heart. So Musa alayhi salam, another interpretation is saying, my Lord, this is the place where my intention is there. Because if my, if my chest is now polluted from the whispers of shaitan, then what happens to my intentions? Any pure intentions that I have is gone down the drain. So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is being asked by Musa alayhi salam, Ya Allah, expand for me my chest so that my intentions become pure. This is Musa alayhi salam worried about his intentions and who am I and who are you. Now let me beautifully 
narrate the following analogy for my younger brothers and sisters. When I say this is a chest which stores the secrets and the intention so that shaitan doesn't contaminate it, pollute it. In fiqh, in jurisprudence, if we take water, for example, there are multiple ways to categorize that water, right? In the type of water, it's mutlaq, mudaf, right? Pure water, clean water, mixed water, abejari, still water, running water, or in size, there is water that's less than these amounts of qur, or water that is more of the amount of qur, right? Now, let's go to the size of water, the amount of water that you hold. If you have a vessel that holds on a t amount of water that is less than qur, what happens if a single drop of najasa, blood for example, drops in? Regardless of whether the water changes its color, taste or smell, the entire water is now najis. You have to throw the entire water away. However, what happens when your vessel holds water that is a lot more than good water? Then however many drops of najasa come into this vessel, as long as that water doesn't change its color, smell or taste, that entire vessel of water is pure and tahir. Similarly, Musa السلام, is telling, Oh Allah, expand for me my chest so much so it becomes so big that it doesn't get contaminated, it doesn't get polluted by the whispers of shaitan so that I'm able to keep my intentions for your work as clean as possible. This is a second interpretation of Rabbi Shrahli Sadri, my Lord, expand for me my chest. And what's the third interpretation? And the third interpretation of the same verse is what happens when an individual has in shirah or sadr. When an, in, an individual has an expanded chest, he is at ease. He is at tranquil, he is at peace, he is at comfort, he is no longer depressed, he is no longer anxious, he is no longer stressed. Right? So here when Musa alayhi salam was saying, Rabbi Shahli Sadri, the third interpretation was that he was saying, My Lord, expand for me my chest so that I am at peace. I am able to not be depressed and stressed and anxious in carrying out the mission that you have allotted for me. Now, as a brilliant side point, um, to show the superiority of our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi wa Wasallam I'd like to narrate the following beautiful but albeit a side point In Surah Al-Inshirah, what does Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala say? Alam nashrah laka sadra In the case of Musa Alayhi Salaam, Musa asks Rabbi Shrah Li Sadri, my Lord expand for me my chest but in the case of Rasulullah, look at the superiority of Rasulullah over all other prophets. Allah automatically says to the Rasulullah, have we not already expanded your chest for you? This is the superiority of Rasulullah over all other prophets. But we continue with our topic of the dua of Musa alayhi salam. So in this lesson, we try to understand the interpretation of Rabbi Shrah alayhi salam. Firstly, it's a vessel, it's a container that holds your heart, which holds the secret of Allah. Secondly, it holds the pure intentions that you have. And thirdly, it holds your confidence within you. That's lesson number three, Rabbi Shrah Sadri. And then Musa continues with his dua, وَيَسِّرْلِي amri, And make the task that is ahead of me easy for me. Again, does Musa alayhi salam say, Oh Allah, get rid of this task? No, he says, my Lord, Make this task that is ahead of me easy for me so that I'm able to complete it effectively. And like we discussed in the first lesson, smooth seas never make skilled sailors. It's the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you and I have challenges in this world so that we're able to grow, we're able to promote, we're able to develop ourselves. But the question you may ask me is, what's the point of difficulties in the first place? You see, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, firstly, in Surah Al-Baqarah, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وُسْعَهَا By no means does Allah place upon a soul a burden that which is beyond what it can bear. 
So firstly, let us all be tranquil at the same time that if I see any issue in front of me, any challenge, any problem in front of me, I know my Lord is bigger than that problem and whatever skills and competencies and qualifications that he's given me are more than sufficient to overcome this task, however impossible it may seem. That's number one. Number two, let me give you another analogy that will help. My elders know much better than I do, but this is my younger brothers and younger sisters. You see, whenever our child goes to school and they come back from school, what would the parents do? The parents would be like, do some extracurricular activities. They'd be like, I just done my homework. No, no, do some more homework. Fine. Go play some badminton. I'm really tired. No, go play some football. Why? I'm not really comfortable. No, go do it. Fine. Then they'll come, okay, now we're going what tonight, you reciting the Akumail, you reciting Yasin, you doing a speech. And again, the kids will be like, dad, mom, seriously, public speaking is really not my thing. I really don't know how to speak publicly. But still, the parents will force their children, encourage their children, motivate their children. No, go stand in front of the crowd. You see, public speaking is one of the most feared things in people's life. After public speaking comes death. So public speaking is no easy feat. And a lot of our kids recite beautiful du'as, beautiful surahs and beautiful speeches and they should be encouraged. But you see the kid will always say, no, 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 I really don't want to do it. But the parents who knows the potential of the kid knows exactly what that kid has the potential and they will encourage the kid. They will sign them up for nohas and marthiyas and be like, okay, tonight you're reciting by the way. And the kid will be like, no, really, I don't want to recite. I'm not ready for it. But the parents will be like, no, you're doing it. Right? Similarly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows our capabilities. He knows what our potential is. We might be like, Allah, I'm not ready for this mission. I'm not ready for this challenge. Allah tells us, no, no, I, you are ready for this. Here, take this challenge so that you're able to develop yourself. Here, take this issue so that you're able to grow yourself. Here, take this problem so that you're able to promote your skills and competency. And this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is trying to do when He gives us Challenges and tasks that come our way. You see, when the ayat of Inna um, ma'al usri yusra, Inna ma'al usri yusra were revealed, the Prophet was seen smiling. So, in this ayat, Allah says, For verily, after every difficulty comes ease, after every difficulty comes ease. So, when these ayats were revealed, the Holy Prophet was seen laughing, smiling. The companions around him said, Say, Ya Rasulullah, why are you smiling? He says, because for every usr, for every difficulty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given two yusrs, or more than two eases. You see, in the Arabic language, usr is a definite word. It's one, singular, that's it. Yusr, however, is a more indefinite, a plural word. Here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, although I give you one difficulty, but I'm going to open up so many doors of solutions, so many doors of Barakah and Rahmah for you. Some ulama say that one easy is for this one and the other easy is for the next one. However, whenever we do see problems, don't we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has opened so many doors of solutions for us? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala preparing us for these challenges so that we grow but at the same time giving us all of the skills, all of the competencies that we need to be successful individuals in this world and in the era. This was lesson number four, right? وَيَسِّرْلِ أَمْرِ وَحْلُ الْعُقْدَةً مِلْ لِسَانِ Prophet Musa says, Oh Allah, remove the knot from my tongue. Untie the knot from my tongue. Now, scholars here present a very beautiful story we see in the narration. You see, when Musa السلام, was an infant, was a baby, a toddler even, the new Musa السلام, was living at the house of Fir'aun, Right? And Fir'aun, as we knew, ruled with an iron fist, would kill and butcher the Banu Israel. So at this point, Musa a.s. was in the lap of Fir'aun, playing with his beard. And with the force of Musa, he grabs hold of the beard of Fir'aun and pulls it. And in that, a few strands of beard come out. Now Fir'aun, being paranoid he was, he was thinking to himself, if this boy is doing this to my beard right now, when he grows up, he's going to topple my government. And this is exactly what happens. However... In order to console him, Asiya tells him, look, don't kill him. He's only a baby. He's only a toddler. 
What is he going to do? He's no prophet. He's no special individual. He's just a baby. If you kill him, you'd have killed an innocent man. Innocent child. Fir'aun says, very well, let, let's put him to the test. And you all know the story. Fir'aun puts in front of Musa alayhi salam a shiny ruby. Something that is very, very shiny, but is very valuable. At the same time, again, he puts a fiery coal, which is again shiny, but very dangerous. And Musa alayhi salam, being a prophet, he goes towards the shiny ruby. But at this point, Jibra'il comes, guides his hand towards the fiery coal. And at that point, Musa alayhi salam puts it in his uh, mouth and so now he burns his tongue and so for the rest of his life the narration say that Musa alayhi salam had a stutter right Musa alayhi salam had a speech impediment so Musa alayhi salam says Ya Allah Ya Qahu Qahu so that um, Rabbi shrah li sadri wa yasir li amri wa halul uqdata min lisani my lord untie my tongue get rid of this speech impediment so that the people may understand me this is part one of the dua the second part of the dua was وَيَفْقَهُ قَوْلِي So that the people may understand me. Now this is a beautiful dua. This is as much of a dua for that individual that may have a speech impediment. As much as that individual has a stutter. As for you or I who may not have the stutter. You see Musa is saying, make my speech so that the people may understand me. Again, let me give you another analogy for my younger brothers and sisters. You see, sometimes you have individuals that are one of the most well-educated individuals you'll ever meet. Well-read, a professor, for example, in a university. Someone who has a doctorate, a PhD. But if you want to ask that individual, what is it that you do um, for work? Can you please come and explain to a bunch of primary school kids? Forget school kids. Even if they want to explain it to us, it go way above our heads, Why? Right? Because sometimes the way that they explain things isn't as easy for us to understand, even though they may be well read, well understood and well versed. However, you may have someone else in the crowd that may not be as well read or as educated, but their charisma in it is such a way, their way of speech is such a way that when they start explaining to you, you're able to understand everything that they tell you. And similarly, Musa is telling, Oh Allah, you have given me so much of your ma'rifah in my heart. You have given me so much of your secrets in my chest. I fear that if I go, they might not understand me. So, oh Allah, make it so that when I say your message, يَفْقَهُ So that the people are able to effectively understand what I'm trying to say. SubhanAllah, what a beautiful dua for you and I. يَفْقَهُ And then Musa continues, وَجَعَلِّي وَزِيرًا مِنْ أَهْلِي Haruna Akhi. He says, My Lord, give me a wazir from my family. Harun, my brother. And this is towards the end of our majlis. And inshallah, we'll go towards summary and conclusion and then um, the musibah of tonight. Musa alayhi salam here says, My Lord, give me someone so that they can help me. You see, Musa is telling you or I. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us people, a community, a network, our colleagues, our friends, our family. If you are stuck in a difficult situation, there's no harm in asking people for help. There's no harm in asking your family for support. They are there to give you some support. In wazir, in Arabic comes from the word wizard, which means a heavy load. Which is why you have a king that has a wazir. In his absence, a wazir is able to take over that heavy load of being a king and is able to duly discharge the duties of a king. And similarly, Musa alayhi salam here says, My Lord, give me someone that is able to discharge my duties and is able to support me in the mission that you have given me so that I'm able to carry out the mission that I have. Similarly, in this world, if I am in need, if my health is too well, then I, I don't look for within my house that I have everything, all skills and competences. No, I go towards a doctor. If I need financial advice, I go towards an accountant. If I need to buy some groceries, I go to a supermarket, right? If we, if we need um, this or whatever skills and competences that we need to make use of, we go to those individuals within our network and get their support, get their help. There's no harm in asking for help from people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given everyone as a blessing to us so that we're able to use one another. We help someone else and someone else also helps us. And so these were some of the lessons that we get from the dua of Musa. However, again, another point. 
You see, Harun, Harun is asked for by Musa to support and help him. And at this juncture, we remember of the hadith of our beloved Prophet, who says, Ya Ali, anta minni, bimanzilati, Haruna, me Musa, O oh Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. There's such a multiple similarities that scholars have put forward between Ali السلام, and Rasulullah and Harun and Musa. However, I'm only going to mention a few. I'll, get, I'll make this majlisa, panjatani majlisa, and I'll mention five such reasons. One of the first reasons why the Holy Prophet says, Ya Ali, anta, bam, anta minzilati, anta minni, bimanzilati Haruna min Musa. Oh Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. On the most fundamental level, on the most basic of level, Harun, when he went to the Mount Sinai to get the book of Torah, for 40 days he could not leave his community. For 40 days he could not leave his nation leaderless without an imam. Oh Ali, how can they imagine that I am going to leave this best religion without a Khalifa? Oh Ali, just like Harun was a Khalifa to Musa, you are my Khalifa after me. This is one of the... Oh Ali! First point. Second similarity. Ya Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. Just like Musa السلام, required help and support. Just like he said, Ya Allah, send Harun with me and I bring the government of it own down for you. Oh Ali, just the same way that Musa needed someone to support him. Any successes that you see in the religion of Islam, any successes that you see in my religion, it's because of the support that you have given me. And for that reason, oh Ali, you are to me like Harun was to Musa. Point number three. The narration states that Harun was a lot more eloquent than Musa alayhi salam. Now we're not saying at all that Rasul, that Amir al-Mu'mineen was more eloquent than Rasulullah. Not at all. Rasulullah was at the peak of eloquence. He was at the zenith of eloquence. What we are saying is the message of Musa was better understood through the doors of Harun. Harun was able to better propagate the message of Musa to the people, to the magicians, to the Pharaoh. Similarly, the Holy Prophet says, Ana Madinatul Ilm wa Ali Yun Babuha. If you wish to understand my message, if you wish to understand my Lord, if you wish to enter into the city of knowledge, then do so from the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. For those that come over the walls and through the windows are thieves. They're not believers. And oh Ali, which is why you are like to me as Harun was to Musa. <laughs> Fourth similarity. Look at the progeny of Harun and Musa. And look at the progeny of Amir al-Mu'mineen and Rasulullah. In the progeny of Harun and Musa, whose progeny is a lot more innumerate and multiplied? It's the progeny of Harun alayhi salam. And similarly, we see that the progeny of Rasulullah was multiplied through Amir al-Mu'mineen. The grandfather was Rasulullah. Amir al-Mu'mineen was the father. And the link between the two is... Lady Fatima. And so the progeny of Rasulullah was furthered through the progeny of Amir al Mu'mini. A fifth similarity, and inshallah, we'll end it here. You see, in the fiqh of Banu Israel, in the jurisprudence of Banu Israel, no one is allowed to go into their temples and sleep in their synagogues until and unless they are a progeny of Harun. You see, because you may be in a state of Najasa. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't like you going inside the, uh, a synagogue or a place of worship or a masjid when you're in a state of najasa, except for the family of and the, for the children of Harun alayhi Similarly, when the Holy Prophet 
built a mosque, when he built Masjid al-Nabawi, all of the Sahaba, all of the companions built their houses around the mosque. And so you would have one door that would lead directly inside the mosque and another door that would lead out into the marketplace, into the city center. At that point, all of these individuals, all of the Sahaba, whether they were in the state of purity or whether they weren't in the state of purity, they would open the house, open their door, go inside the masjid and go towards the other exit. Allah did not like that. He reveals upon Rasulullah, Ya Rasul, tell your Sahaba that every single door that opens into the masjid is to be closed except for the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. Ali's door I love. Let him keep his door open. Let him use this door. I love Ali ibn Abi Talib. When Rasulullah says this tradition to the people, the people started getting distressed. They started getting annoyed. They say, Ya Rasulullah, another fadila of Amirul Mu'mineen. Why is it now that we have to close our doors? Rasulullah says, I do not speak of my own whim. Whatever I say, Allah says it through me. Allah loves Ali ibn Abi Talib so much that he has ordered every single door to the masjid to be closed except the door of Ali ibn Abi Talib. <laughs> Brothers and sisters, these were the similarities of Ya Ali, Anta Manzilati, Anta Minni bin Manzilati, Haruna bin Musa. Oh Ali, you are to me as Harun was to Musa. And so brothers and sisters, tonight we now get to the point where we're trying to summarize what we've taken from tonight's discussion. We, uh, the title of tonight's discussion was titled, The Dua of Musa alayhi salam. And here we started off discussing the impossible task that Musa had, that he had to go to Fir'aun who had a death warrant against him. And in the Dua of Rabbi Shrahli, we discussed six lessons. First lesson was, that whatever your challenge is, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is bigger. Never run away from your challenges. Number two was never leave the dua. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves a tearful eye that recites dua to him. Number three was Rabbi Shrahli Sabri, expand for me my chest. And that chest can mean that vessel that holds your heart, holds your secrets, holds your intention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and gives you peace and contentment. Then we got to the fourth lesson. Uh, amri that make my task easy for me and that Allah gives us a challenge so that we're able to grow and develop. The fifth lesson was about communication. In order to be effective communicators, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And finally, there is no harm in asking for support from your networks, from your friends and from your family. And with this, we conclude tonight's topic of the dua of Prophet Musa alayhi salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Brothers and sisters, tonight is a great night of Masih. Tonight is the night of Shahada, of Babul Hawaj, of that Imam that if you were to ask any dua, Using his name, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would not reject that dua. <coughs> Brothers and sisters, before going to a masiba, I'd like to narrate to you a beautiful story. A single tradition from the Imam can change one's life. Once the Imam was walking through the streets of Medina, he comes across a house where you can hear loud music. He sees a maid, or according to another tradition, the wife of the owner. The Imam asks the owner of this house, is he a free man or is he a slave? The lady says, no, of course he's a free man. The Imam remarks, of course he's a free man. For if he was a slave, he would know that his master is looking over him. When the lady goes inside, the man asks, who was it that you were talking to? She tells him this line that if this house owner was a free man, that he would, that if he was a true slave, then he would know that his master is looking at him. The man realized what the imam was trying to say. He left his house without wearing his slippers behind the imam and say, Ya imam, 
I've heard many a times for people telling me stop music, but the way that you've explained it to me, it struck a heart, it struck a sensitive chord in my heart, and from this day on, never will I listen to music. This man was Bishr al Haf. Hafi, you tell the person who wears no slippers when he walks out. And there's a huge Sufi cult. There's a huge Sufi following of this Bishr al-Hafi that was a student of the Imam. That one line made this individual Bishr al-Hafi someone who is followed by hundreds and thousands around the world. Tonight, we've come here to commemorate that very Imam. Allah. <coughs> Mourners of Imam Musa al kazim The Imam would spend 15 years of his life in the prisons of Harun al Abbasi. When first the Imam was arrested, he is brought into the prison of Harun al Abbasi. The Imam looks towards the heavens, he raises his hands, he says, Ya Allah, for entire life I've been praying, give me an opportunity where I am alone so that I may be able to worship you alone. My Lord, I thank you for that honor. My Lord, I thank you for that opportunity. This is the worship of Imam Musa al kazim This prison can be a dangerous place. Many people get lost. Not Imam al kazim He thanks Allah. Ya Allah, thank you for the opportunity. So that I'm now able to worship you in solitary confinement. Listen to the words of the Imam. I'll come to these words a little bit later. They say that the Imam was in prison for 15 years. From the prison of Basra, he would be moved to the prison in Qantara, and then he'd be moved to a prison of Fadl bin Rabi. Once, Fadl bin Rabi, he calls his friend Ahmad, Oh Ahmad, come, what do you see inside the prison cell? Cell. The Ahmad says, My uh, Fadl, all I see is a white piece of cloth. Fadl says, No, look more closely. This is the Imam of the Shias. This is Imam Musa al Kazim. In the sujood, this is the amount of food Imam Musa al kazim would be given. This is Imam Musa al kazim a white piece of cloth. Once, Harun al Abbasi sends one of the most beautiful of girls in front of Imam. She says, oh man, whatever you want from me, come, I will give it to you. The Imam doesn't respond. She says for the second time, come, what is it that you want? I will give it to you. The Imam doesn't respond. For the third time, she says, come, I will give you whatever it is you want. The Caliph has sent me towards you. The Imam tells her, why would I want something from you when Allah has offered me better? This lady, this lady does not know what to do. The guards say that when we came into the prison cell, we saw Imam Musa al kazim in Sajda. Behind Imam al kazim was this lady, also in Sajda. Fadl bin Rabi would say, how do you expect me to torture this man in the daytime? He fasts and in the nighttime he prays and worships. This was the prison of Fadl bin Rabi. After this prison, the Imam is moved to the prison of Fadl bin Yahya. And then a time comes where the Imam is moved to the prison of Asimbi. Allah Akbar, may Allah give you patience for what I am able to narrate to you. The last of the prisons was of Asindi. You do you know what sort of a prison of Asindi was? It was a hole. The Imam was placed upon that hole. The Imam was not able to move. He was not able to sit. He was not able to sleep. The Imam was made to stand during the day and during the night. But how would the Imam know that now is day or now is night? There was a rock placed upon the prison cell of the Imam. The Imam would not know whether it's daytime or nighttime. The Imam would call out from his prison cell. He would say, oh gods, whenever you go out to pray, at least come, tell me, so that I may attempt to do some prayers. Allahu Akbar, this was the prison of Asindi. At this point, the narration state, may Allah give you peace. 
patience. I apologize to my Sayyid brothers. Allahu Akbar. May Allah give you patience when they would take out the rock. The narration state the Imam would take his neck out to look at some daylight. A God would come, a Mal'oon would come, and he would kick the face of Imam. The gods, the enemies would come and they would smack and they would kick and they would hit the face of the Imam. Allahu Akbar. This is the state of the Imam's imprisonment. This is the torture. Brothers and sisters, you remember the dua of the Imam. Such a sabir Imam that when he came, he prays, My Lord, thank you for the opportunity to give me time to worship you alone. But Allah knows how the Imam spent 15 years in prison. Allah knows what sort of torture the Imam was given at the end of his imprisonment. He says, Ya Allah, I thank you for the opportunity that I can worship you. But Allah, I beg of you, this is enough. Release me from the prisons of Harun. Allahu Akbar, brothers and sisters, this was the imprisonment of the Imam. We always say, La yawmak yawmak, Ya Aba Abdullah. There is no day like yours, Ya Aba Abdullah. But at the same time say, there are no years like the years of Imam Musa al Qadim, The Imam that was the most tortured Imam from the Ahl Bayt was Imam Musa al Qadim. <coughs> One companion, he was able to come to the Imam. He was able to say, Ya Imam, we Shias yearn for you. When are you going to be released? The Imam looks at him. He says, Ya Ali, go on Friday morning. I will be there waiting for you at the bridge of Baghdad. You all know where I am headed towards. On the Friday morning, a group of men take the janaz of Imam Musa al kadim They leave it at the bridge of Baghdad. The Shias say, who, are, who is this Imam? They say, Hada Imam al-Rafida. This is the Imam al-Rafida. Azadaran Imam al-Madlum al-Karbala. Azadaran Imam Musa al kadim Aaj ki raat bohat hi rona hai. Aaj ki raat pur से की रात है आज आप किसको पुरसा देंगे आप दो इमामों को पुरसा देना है अभी ताबूत बरामद होगा आप दो इमामों को पुरसा देंगे एक इमाम इमाम जमाना और एक इमाम वो जो खुरासान में मदफून है Imam Zamana Farmate hai Salam ho Mere jad Musa e kadim par Ke jiska janaza Chaar mazduro ne uthaya tha Chaar mazduro ko Pese diye gaye the Or chaar mazduro ne Mola ka janaza uthaya tha Ha Ek panchwa mazdur tha Pese diye gaye Or kaha ke jau Tum nara lagao Nara kya tha Ha Mata Imam Rafida Rafido ka Imam Gumraho ka Imam Mara gaya Allahu Akbar Azadaro Akhri Jumle Sun Sakenga Azadaro Imam Kajo Ghost Thana Wukul Chukata Hadiome Zanjire Itni Vazniti Zanjire Itni Mutiti Ke Imam Ka Ghost Kul Chukata Allahu Akbar Tabut Kabi Deki Tabut Mebi जंजीरें नजर आएंगी रिवायत के जुमले है कि इमाम का जब जंजीरें खोलने चाहा तो आदमी आता है कहता है कि नहीं ये जंजीरें नहीं खुल पाएंगे इमाम के ताबूत में भी जंजीरें नजर आ रही थी हापाओं की भेरिया हाथों की हथकरिया ताबूत में नजर आ रही थी अल्लाह अकबर हाँ आजादा दो इमाम के पास अठारह बेटे थे उन्नीस बेटियां थी लाखों शिया थे लेकिन मजलूमियत सुने इमाम की इमाम को एक जनाजे उठाने वाले चार मजदूर थे जिनको पैसा दिया गया था और फिर एक पांचवा था माता इमाम मुर्रा फिदा तुम्हारे गुमराहों का इमाम मारा गया बस जब इमाम का जनाजा पुले बगदाद में आया था ना तो पुले बगदाद में आया था
देखा तो एक शिया आधे भरता है कफन खोलता है इमाम का जहर आलूद चेहरा नजर आया हथकरिया बंधे हुए थे एक मरतबा मदीने से एक शख्स आता है इमाम को देखता है सीने पे सीना लगाता है फरमाता है बाबा मेरी उन्नीस बहने आपका ईद में इंतजार करते रह गए बाबा आप नहीं आए मदीना वीरान हो गया अल्लाह अकबर खुदा आपको सबर दे एक मरतबा एक मरतबा किसी शख्स ने पूछा कि आप कौन है फरमाया मैं अली बिन मूसा रदा हूँ इनका नाम इनका इनका बेटा मूसा एक आदिम मेरे बाबा है हाँ आजादा रो तारीख में दो ऐसे जनाजे थे कि जिनके हथकरिया ये जिनके रसिया खोले नहीं गए थे एक जनाजा नन्ना सा था शाम में सकीना का कौन सकीना हुसैन के हुसैन के सीने पे सोने वाली सकीना शिमल के तमाचे खाने वाली सकीना जिसके कान भी जख्मी जिसके रुखसार भी जख्मी जिसके कुर्ते का दामन भी जला हुआ एक मरतबा आबिदे बीमार सकीने के सकीना के लाश को उठाकर कहते हैं बाबा ये आपकी अमानत ले लीजिए और एक था खुरासान का अली बिन मुसा बाबा के चेहरे को देखता है लाशा उठाता है फरमाता है अस्सलाम या जद्दा ए मेरे रसूल ए मेरे जद आप पर सलाम हो ये देखिए आपका बेटा मुसाए का